car. What? The water. Oh, okay. Well, I can get some water over there. Yeah, because yeah. I... No, 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 no. When, when, no, when, when I was manager, when I was working with the studio I was, I was the manager. Uh -huh. So she, they said, you know, when I went there, they said, so she was the second. So I said, well, I don't need it. So I asked her, hey, you know, do you like this? So she said, <laughs> then, you know, and then she said, I need, I need, I need, I need permission. He was almost 22 years old. Although he's the youngest child in his family, he was the first one to finish high school and attend college. And it is such an honor for um, Makasa to have him to be our speaker tonight. And his title is Exploring Our Roots, Afro-Caribbeanism in the 21st Century. Pierre recently had his book published and it's titled Education Under Occupation, The Heavy Price of Living in a Neo-Colonized and Globalized World. In this book, Pierre critically analyzes the ongoing and wide-ranging effects of colonialism and globalization on the poor, especially on those living in the third world. The author's overarching argument in this book is that colonization was not merely about the conquest of foreign lands, but it was also about the ideological monitoring of the colonized mind often maintained through Western hegemonic texts and institutional apparatus, such as school and churches. Using a personal narrative, Pierre offers an insider perspective of the negative effect of colonialism on the school system of his native land, Haiti. He goes on to demonstrate how neoliberal economic and political policies of Western imperial powers, such as the United States, have negatively impacted the educational, economic, and political structures of developing countries in the so-called third world. And I believe he has several copies of his text, so if you're interested in purchasing a copy, you can see him after um, the talk. And um, there are refreshments at the back, so feel free to help yourself. And with that, would you please help me welcome Pierre Aurelis. Thank you so much, Sendai, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, also, I want to thank some of your colleagues who worked tirelessly to make this great historical and cultural event possible. Um, tonight, I will not be talking about my book. However, if you want to know more about it, I'll be happy to do so after the talk. Exploring our roots, Afro-Caribbeanism in the 21st century is, will be the, the, the title of my talk tonight. But before I try to explore with you our roots, I would like to begin by reading a poem that I wrote about an hour ago before I came here. Mm -hmm. uh, I entitled the poem, They. Do not ask me yet what they who are they? Um, because I'm sure you will figure out who are they after I finish reading the poem to all of you. They, they say they can break me because they were the ones who made me. They say I have to be civilized so I can finally realize that I am barbarous, that I am savage, like animals who are enraged. They say that I'm black, so it's okay if they break my back. Sometimes they call me brown, and they always put me down. They say my hair is nappy, so I can be unhappy. They say my culture is barbarous. Sometimes they say I am very courageous. They only put what they used to only belittle my humanity, which has been subject to their violence and cruelty. They say my nose is too flat, too big, too ugly. So to mimic them, I must change it. I must have a surgery. Sometimes they tell me to go back to my country, to my native land, instead of helping me and giving me a hand. 
a region they once colonized and brutally exploited. Now it's a poor land with no resources. It's toasted. They constantly look down on my identity, culture, and language. So they make me feel like a bird that is in a cage. I don't want to be in a cage, therefore I'm going to try to go back to my roots. But how do we go back to our roots? How do we explore them? In other words, what are, what are the ways in which we can manage to do so? These are the questions that I asked myself as I was preparing for this talk. But before I try to go back to my roots, hopefully with some of you, I would like to invite some of you, or if not all of you, to take a quick, short journey back to history which I believe is one of the surest guide and source of knowledge that we can rely on to at least shed light on these questions. But there's a problem, it's a very serious problem. That is the history that we, as descendants of Africa and, and the Caribbean have been taught in school, has been a Western version of history. Therefore, I would argue that history is yet to be taught to us. What do we do then? I would propose, nevertheless, we go back to history. Because it seems, for now, for La Ola, we don't have any other choice. But before taking you to, to this crucial journey, let me read to you two important quotes that I got from two important books. The first quote is by Eduardo Galliano from a book that he wrote entitled Upside Down. And the second quote that I, that I will share with you, I got it from a book called Anti-Colonialism and Education, written by George Sifa Day, who is a very prominent intellectual. Galina, Galliano said, and I quote, the Looking Glass School teaches us to forget the past not to learn from it, to accept the future, not to invent it, and unquote. And Sifadi, on the other hand, stated, and I quote, history and context are crucial for anti-colonial undertakings. Understanding our collective past is significant for pursuing political resistance, and unquote. What about me? What do I say? <laughs> I would say, if you really want to hurt me, talk bad about my historical and cultural origins. Why are then these origins so important to me, and hopefully to, me, to so many of you tonight? Of course, the answer to this question will depend, will vary, depend on one's understanding of one's past and history. In other words, for those who have some understanding of, who, of where they come from, misspeaking or, or worse yet, looking down upon their historical and cultural roots is nothing else but a blow to their identities, a blow to their sense of self, and brief, a blow to who they are, which will lead me then to talk about the importance of history. First, I would argue that history, as a, dis as a discipline, should not be simply about past narratives. Nor should it be a discipline that allows them to merely hear about the past and move on. History, in my opinion, should be an educational tool that allows students to explore, to question, and even to deconstruct, to use Derrida's word, the past and connect it to the present in order to impact the future. History has, of course, been taught in school. But whose version of history has it been? Has it been the history that reflects the reality of both the Western and the so-called third world, which Africa and Caribbean are a part of? Or has it been a history that glorified Napoleon Bonaparte and Christopher Columbus, while really acknowledging the greatness of Toussaint Louverture, Pastor Mumbatu, Masankara, Amkakabwale, Simon Bolivar, who fought and lost their lives to set people, to set their own people free from colonial subjugation and slavery? Given the media where I grew up, it took me decades to understand the dialectical relationship between 
the past, the present, and the future. Such a dialectical relationship, in my view, constitutes the triangle of humanity. However, my adults in my neighborhood, it seems to me that one of the components of that triangle was a painful thing for them to talk about. I mean, the past. They seem to have an easier time to talk about the present and the future, but not the past. Maybe they were right. Isn't it a waste of human and intellectual energy talking about the past, which is already gone? Isn't it painful referring to a past that is marked of colonialism and slavery? In other words, isn't it a self-torture to speak of the past that might remind one of the devastating effects of colonialism and slavery on those who were colonized and enslaved? Wouldn't it be too dangerous to the mind of the youth to allow them to be knowledgeable about the history and the past? Finally, it is not when, right, when she states, and I quote, the struggle to achieve the past and survive the present is an unfinished journey. And I quote, in analyzing this question in a very superficial way, one might agree with the adults in my neighborhood who subconsciously seem to fear the past while embracing the present and the future. Furthermore, given that we cannot shape or reconstruct the past, isn't it logical and practical to forget about it and focus on the present and the future? But if we took that path, what sense would the world make to us? In other words, how would we have a better understanding of the present and work for a bright future, or at least imagine a bright one, if certain historical facts were concealed from us? In this regard, one of my intellectual heroes, Edward Said, stated, and I quote, how we formulate or represent the past shapes our understanding and views of the present. And I quote, drawing on Said's argument, I would say that trying to discourage students from critically questioning the pasting of the past, as Eliot put it, is historically and humanly harmful. Unfortunately, this has been the ideological tool used by the dominant class to oppress people like me, and to maintain the status quo. Said so is clearly understood and misappropriated by this dominant class who has been trying to control the mind of the oppressed through public consent, <coughs> so that the latter, meaning the oppressed, will not enter with the past. These dominant class also understand that allowing the oppressed, the oppressed to enter with the past might enable them to understand their horrible, present, cultural, economic, political, and social situation, and how this situation came into being. And of course, it's too dangerous to let the oppressed discover the truth about the past, because such a discovery is too threatening, is too scary, is too dangerous. <coughs> the logic behind the hidden ideology of the dominant class is that once the mind of the oppressed is controlled, they most likely will be on be unable to revolt against the inhuman economic and social conditions which might have resulted from or informed by past historical events. Now, going back to important issues such as slavery and colonization, I would argue that encouraging science about these issues is not only harmful, but it's also intellectually irresponsible, as I pointed out. Science stated, and I quote, one cannot postpone discussions of slavery colonialism, racism, and any serious investigation of modern Indian, African, Latin, and North American, Arabic, Caribbean, and Commonwealth literature. Nor is it intellectually responsible to discuss them without referring to their embattled circumstances either in post-colonial societies or as, or as marginalized and or subjugated subjects confined to secondary spots in the curriculum and metropolitan centers, and unquote. Postponing discussion of important issues such as slavery, colonialism, and racism, as I mentioned, has been a tireless ideological strategy that the dominant class has used to stay in powerful positions in society. And institutions such as school, the church, and the mass corporate media have been the channels through which outright lies and silence have been, have been circulated. In other words, these institutions have been used as an, as an ideological apparatus 
to freeze people's mind, people's presence of mind, to use Pepe's uh, super word. So they can become di docile recipient of the dominant class lies, which are really aimed to make the oppressed loyal and obedient servant of the imperialist world. As I noted earlier, history has been taught at all levels in school, from kindergarten to college levels. But from what in this perspective has it been taught? Has it been taught to protect the interests of the dominant class? Has the history of those from Africa and the Caribbean been taught to them? If so, has it been taught by professor teachers who are knowledgeable and historically conscious and sensitive to African, Caribbean, and African Americans' long historical and cultural struggles? This, in my humble opinion, should be a fountain of knowledge from which one can retrieve various historical components of the past. So historical component of the past should aim to empower students so that they can make sense of what has shaped the historical being, as well as what inform or should inform or should have informed the present and future beings. In other words, history should be used as a tool to interrogate the past in order to have a better understanding of it. In short, as Howard Zinn notes, and I quote, if history is to be creative to, to anticipate a possible future without denying the past, it should emphasize new possibilities by disclosing those hidden episodes of the past when, even if in brief flashes, people show the ability to resist, to dread together, and occasionally to win. Ladies and gentlemen, my fellow human beings, I think, not I think, I believe, I strongly believe we need to revitalize and honor our past. It's my belief that any society that really cares for the intellectual Nourishment and growth of the youth should strongly encourage them to critically analyze historical events that have shaped the past. This, I would argue, will help them become culturally and historically informed critical beings. Past events should not be frozen or buried in the past. Rather, they should be cherished, honored, and used to inform us what path to take in order to, to enlighten our present life with hope, whose power will enable us to shape or at least imagine a world of possibilities for everyone, regardless of their racial, ethnic, linguistic, social backgrounds, and sexual orientation. This is briefly really captured by Trask, who argues, and I quote, we do not need nor do we want to, to be liberated from our past because it's the source of our understanding. We sit firmly in the present with our back to the future and our eyes fixed on the, upon the past, seeking historical answers for present day dilemmas. And I'll quote, Unfortunately, standing and in blocking the, the path to clear understanding of the past have been the agenda of the, of the dominant class in society. An agenda that, that reveals itself and their invested interests in preventing people from formerly colonized land from, from having access to a collective consciousness, to a collective memory, and critical knowledge of the past. Western neocolonialists feel that if neocolonial subjects, or the so-called post-colonial subjects, had a critical and sound understanding of the past, they would then dare imagine a fight for a better world, where resources would be fairly and justly distributed between the Westerners and non-Westerners. But this Despite all these ugly scenes that I just described throughout my talk, there is hope. Because there are scholars from us, from the so-called third world, who have challenged and unveiled those lies that dominant class have been trying to sell, sell us. These intellectuals such as Amitabh Fakwal, Patrice Mumba have insisted on finding out alternative version of world history. They realize that if they fail to do so, they will be just be they will be just passive citizens, deprived of recollection of who their ancestors were and therefore of who they are. Thus it goes without saying that a critical analysis and understanding of the past 
is quintessential to one's historical being. Intellectuals such as C.R.R. James, Matthew Garvey, Toussaint Louverture, Thomas Sankara, Sheik Entadiop, Walter Wadney, just to name a few, are prime examples of scholars who refuse to stay on the margin of world history. They urge their contemporaries, present generation like us, and generations to come, not to live on the shadow of world history. In Sheik Entadiop's view, historical factor is of great importance. He believes that such a factor contributes to a sense of collectiveness and unity among people. Job maintained, and I, and I quote, the historical factor is the cultural cement that unifies the isolated elements of a people to make them into a whole, and unquote. Like the Antigua historian and activist, Walter Wadley, Sheikh and Tadjou tirelessly fought with his fan and brand against the dominant ideology of the European class that has been trying to oppress people that are actually oppressed people in Africa, the Caribbean, and people in other marginalized parts of the world. The scholarly work and intellectual activism of this prominent Senegalese critical thinker have inspired many post-colonial subjects, myself included, to be actors, to be, act to be actors, actresses, and makers of history rather than passive spectators of historical events like the dominant class wants us to be. More importantly, Sheikh and Tadjok has, in, has encouraged the oppressed not to miss the historical rendezvous to collectively and actively reflect on the past, act on the present, and envision a bright future for themselves and other fellow human beings. This, of course, has made them and others become, in the eyes of the, those power brokers, what I would call critical men, critical dangerous men. Another treasure that all of us, as descendants of Africa and the Caribbean, need to cherish and protect is our culture. Amical Cabral, the Guinean and Caribbean leader, who fought vigorously against the Portuguese colonizers' cultural invasion in Virgin and Guinea Bissau, strongly urged people to, in, to defend the culture. Cabral dedicated most of his political and militant life defending the culture of his country, both nationally and internationally, against, of course, Western cultural invasion, which Pablo describes in those terms. And I quote, Pablo said, whether urban or harsh, cultural invasion is always an act of violence against the person of the invaded culture who lose their originality or face, or face the threat of losing it. In cultural invasion, the invaders are the authors and actors and the process. Those they invade are just the objects. The invaders mold, those they invade are mold. The invaders choose, those they invade follow that choice or are expected to follow it. The invaders act, those they invade have only the illusion of acting, and unquote. Now, if I, want to, if I go back to Cabral, I would say that he was a cultural and political ambassador, not only for his native land, Cape Verde, but for many countries in Africa. In his classic book, Return to the Source, Cabral strongly encouraged us to try to preserve our culture from the colonial and imperial influence of the West. Cabral used culture as a tool of resistance to foreign subjugation of colonized lands at the time, such as Cape Verde and Guinea Bissau. Cabral did not merely acknowledge the vital role of culture in the liberation movement, but he also emphasized and advocated for its full integration in the historical and political life of colonized countries in Africa. He did so because he understood that imperialist and colonial dominations of colonized subjects also entails the cultural domination of the latter, meaning colonial subjects. The Scarborough strove to help its people be aware of the importance of using their cultural resources and values as a counter weapon in the, fi in the fight against imperial and colonial dominations. Cabral said, and I quote, it understood that imperialist domination by denying the historical development of the dominated people necessarily 
also denies the cultural development. It's also understood why imperialist domination, like all other foreign domination, for its own security and interests, requires cultural oppression and the attempt at, at a direct or indirect liquidation of the essential elements of the culture of the dominated people, and unquote. So drawing on Kabbalah's view of the political and historical importance of culture, I would say that culture is a vital tool that foreign invaders shouldn't ever be allowed to influence, especially when a people engage in the struggle for self-affirmation, for self-determination, and cultural and linguistic liberations from the West. The reason being is that if the culture of formerly colonized or minority people is put on the siege, this might weaken, weaken the resistance to linguistic and political domination of the West, as well as the resistance to exploitation by dominant groups in their own native lands. Because the enemy is not only in the West, but also in our native lands. So we need to buy it, we need to fight the enemy on both, on different angles. Defense and preservation of one's culture, in my opinion, is key to one's liberation of servile Western assimilation. Like Emma Francois, Marius Conde, Edwin Santica, Esmeralda Santiago, George Padmore, Paulo Freire, Antonio Furman, Jean Price Mass, and Walter Wadney. We as intellectuals from the so-called third world countries, what is or should be our role in the defense of our culture and historical roots? In other words, what are we going to do to continue the legacy and carry the historical torch that has passed to us from these intellectual shoe and heroes? Isn't it our moral, historical, and political obligations to act as ambassadors and borderless intellectuals who are willing to defend and proudly represent our culture and historical heritage. I hope that as descendants of the former slaves, we will not simply be the receptacle, the transmitter, or worse yet, the executor of ideas articulated by Western, by conservative Western intellectuals. Rather, we will try to act as authentic intellectuals who challenge ideas and Western practices that have been oppressing too many of us while living in the so-called third world and the diaspora. Equally important, I hope that we involve, we get involved in global political and social movements aimed at fighting cultural and, histor and historical misrepresentation of us through text and so-called Western masterpieces that many of us require to use in our classrooms. In short, as Thomas Sinkar said it, and I I hope that we will, and I quote, understand that the battle for an ideology that serves the need of the disinherited masses is not vain. That we can only become credible on an international level by being creative, by portraying a faithful image of our people, an image conducive to carrying out fundamental change in political and social conditions, and preventing our country from foreign domination and exploitation, which leave us no other perspective than bankruptcy, and unquote. As Sekar suggested, internationally, as African and Caribbean intellectuals, we should, as, we should act as ambassadors of our countries and be willing to engage in an ideological battle to represent and defend our dignity. Nationally, we should play the role of intellectual vanguards that are tirelessly fighting against foreign, foreign cultural invasion. Both nationally and internationally, we should work to heighten and defend our national dignity and culture. Historically, one of the biggest challenges that countries with a historical burden of colonialism have been facing is to rescue their culture, which was, and still is, to some extent, perceived as a savage culture by both the colonizers and those neo-colonizers. It is therefore imperative that we, as Caribbean and African intellectuals, and ordinary people who live under colonization or have had to live with the aftermath of it, redefine who we are, because the cultural image that has been portrayed by, about us, by the colonizers and the new colonizers, is an image of savagery, an image of the uncivilized. Remember, when the invaders, when, when the invaders, when the colonizers colonizing, colonize our country, they went there with something in mind, to civilize us, well, to civilize us. But I don't see how 
they can civilize us through colonization, through occupation, which is nothing else but a violent action against those who are colonized and occupied. This is well captured by Aulita Woy when she maintains, 50 years after independence, India is still struggling with the legacy of colonialism, still fetching from the cultural insult. As citizens, we are still caught up in the business of disproving, of disproving the white world definition of us, and unquote. As Woy's statement indicates, even though formerly colonized countries in Africa, in the Caribbean, in South Central America, and in Asia have gained their independence, they continue facing the challenge to make the West respect the culture, which is often looked down upon. With that said, I would suggest that we, I mean, we, whose ancestors are from Africa and the Caribbean, play the role of cultural vanguard in our daily fight against Western cultural invasion of our native lands. Our cultural vanguard role as intellectuals as I understand it, should not be limited to the earning of a college degree and having a well-paying job. And for scholars of African and Caribbean descent, myself included, the cultural vanguard world should not be reduced to teaching, writing, publishing, and lecturing at conferences, like I'm doing now. <laughs> it should also consist of reaching out to the poor and helping them as much as they possibly can. We can start playing that cultural vanguard role by helping the masses and the youth organize cultural and historical events like this one, where together with them, we explore and discuss the important <coughs> interconnection between nation, state, and culture. Moreover, to the sharing and exchange of ideas, we can guide and help the masses and the youth use cultural artifacts such as songs rooted in the culture and history as a form of cultural and historical resistance to fight against Western neo-colonial cultural, economic, and political dominations. Equally important, on a national level, as cultural bring and intellectual, we ought to make effort to fight against oppressive cultural practices and social norms that have contributed to the marginalization and oppression of certain subcultural groups in our community. Sub subcultural groups such as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and people with disabilities. I'm firmly convinced that the fight against any form of oppression, such as neocolonialism, imperialism, and racism, should also entail fighting against other forms of oppressions, such as sexism and homophobia, that often occur in our native and diasporic lands. All forms of oppression are interrelated and therefore should be equally fought. I'm fully aware that what I'm articulating here tonight might be a challenge for intellectuals, myself included, who have been educated in the West and immersed in Western discourses. So in order for what I'm proposing here to become a reality, we need to develop what Paulo Freire called continuity style. Basically, what, what powerfully meant by that is critical consciousness. Or we may have to reinvent ourselves, as all of we urge all of us to do. Otherwise, we might end up regurgitating what we have been taught in Western universities in terms of Western discourses and ideology, which have, which have programmed the mind of many of us to behave and act like Westerners, like Westerners, forgetting or pretend to forget how historical and cultural roots all in all, as sons and daughters, or simply ex or former slaves, we have, who have had to deal on a daily basis with racism and other forms of discrimination and oppression, we have a double task to assume. On an international level, we need to talk back to Western power that sometimes refuses to treat us on an equal footing despite our intellectual, academic, and professional achievements. While on a national scale, we, I repeat, we, we need to work tirelessly to fight, to protect, and maintain our culture. So I would conclude saying that if we are to earn a national reputation as cultural vanguard or ambassador of our country, we first need to, cultural, to be culturally immersed in our own culture and work hard to protect it from Western 
cultural invasion and, and domination. And to earn international, an, an international reputation, we should not be afraid of taking risks to tell dangerous truths about social, racial, economic, sexual, and political inequalities, regardless of where they occur, and regardless of whom happens to be a victim of these inequalities. And with, we should not be afraid of engaging in the defense of human rights, wherever they, hap wherever they happen to be violated. Whether it happens in the Caribbean, in Africa, here in the US, or any part of the world, because we are the world. As Martin Fleking said while he was in jail, in Birmingham, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. <coughs> so placing or putting Martin Luther King's ideas in the context of people of Caribbean and African descent, I would simply add that injustice committed against a Haitian, a Jamaican, a Ghanaian, an Indian from India, a Congolese, a Zimbabwean, a Senegalese, an African American, all simply human beings should be taken as an injustice committed against all of us. We must be united to regain and maintain our strength, or else we'll be weak and die and perish from our internal divisions. And as Amika Kabral and Shigeva said respectively, la lucha continua a salutary assembly. Thank you. Suggest that we have a dialogue instead of having a QA as that. I don't want to be the focus of the center of, uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> so let's just have a dialogue. <coughs> that means I don't have to answer your question. Someone from the, from the crowd can ask can answer your question. Yes. Okay. I have a question. You mentioned that. Um, oh, you, that means me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You mentioned that Kabul said that we should use culture as a weapon or tool to counter the imperialist effects um, of colonialism. But then, how do we defend our own culture? Because even, like, okay, so as an intellectual, right, mm -hmm. if I do go back to my country Zimbabwe, right, and then I say, okay, we need to do this and that. They, in a, they themselves, right, may kind of think that I'm being elitist and that, oh, so you've gone out there to be educated in the West, and so now you're coming here, and you're saying we should do this and that. And so there is that um, quandary that I then face because culture in itself, it's, it's dynamic, and to some extent it's a human construct, and it's it constantly evolving. And so, because now that I am here, I definitely do value a lot of aspects of my culture that I didn't when I was there. So how do I then um, be a cultural vanguard of my nation, um, both there and here, without seeming as though I, I myself have been colonized in my mind? Okay, well, the simplest thing is to decolonize your mind. I think you can use your own question. <laughs> Not only to colonize your mind, when you go back home, of course they're going to perceive it differently because you've been here, you've been educated here. So my suggestion to you is try to make an effort to decolonize your language, to de westernize your language that you are using to interact with them. Because if I were to go back to Haiti now, um, I would perhaps sound different because I've been here a long time. So in order for me to really go back to my roots, I would need to somewhat reinvent the way myself, the way I think. Uh, I would have to take into consideration the context in which I am doing things with my people because <coughs> culture doesn't, you know, changes, it's fluid. The Haiti that I know, um, that I knew 10 years ago, is not the Haiti that is exists now. So it's the same thing uh, for you if you go back to your country. Uh, they're going to look at you differently. They're going to look at you as a stranger. Because you don't look 
you might not dress this, the way they do, you might not talk the way they do, you might not think the way they do, therefore you're gonna really have to open a dialogue. I think through dialogue you can uh, hopefully come up with some kind of consensus. Uh, it's, it's something that we, we, it's a challenge. I don't know if I have the answer to your question, but I think that's one of the things that we might consider is to um, uh, be aware of, kind of, of the kind of discourse you use to interact with your, with your people. And the issue, you know, the social class issue matters as well. Because if you go to, to the countryside, I mean, I mean, I'm not trying to make it sound bad, um, social class is gonna emerge, okay? So you need to take into consideration, you know, uh, to what social class they belong, and to what social class you belong. Because there might be some clash in terms of social class. So there are a lot of components that you need to explore before expecting them to follow what you think will be good for them. So maybe you should ask them what they think will be good for them because you don't, you, you don't live there anymore. They, they are the ones dealing with, you know, all kind of oppression on a daily basis. Look at, look, at, look at where we are now. In a very comfortable, warm auditorium. People, you know, and, and your country might not have access to this, you know. Or might, not, might be doing other things uh, that's not as comfortable as this. So you need to be mindful of that. Um, with all of that said, I think we should also look at it from a different perspective because I think our like African and Caribbean countries, no, Caribbean countries, well, they are a bit westernized. Mm -hmm. Like there's so much of like an American culture that is in or that has become a part of our culture now. Mm -hmm. And like it's perpetuated by our youths and our young people. I mean, they're the future. So if they're the ones that are perpe perpetuating this culture, then mm -hmm. it's going to, in time, become part of the culture of mm -hmm. our country. Mm -hmm. So what are we supposed to do, like we, us here, to like try to break them out of that mm -hmm. westernized, um, Perception of what our culture should be like. Mm -hmm. well, well, I don't want to be the one saying, but you guess it. <laughs> you want to jump in? Yes. Sure. I mean, <coughs> I find that, I mean, that's always a barrier working with. I mean, I, 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 I live not too far from here, and it's like it's a difference between what I'm, in terms of the culture, the what the, the Amer African American youth buy into in my community in terms of, you know, what's popular or what's good or what's, you know, even whether it's degrading or not. It's just that what I found is I can't go into the, you know, just kind of like try to go right up against that and say, no, that's wrong, that's, you know, misogynistic, you shouldn't be listening to that, this is what, you know, we're about. And, it, and it's just like, you really do have to like, you know, on some level find, you know, where they're at and just not try to take that away from them because in some instance to them, that is their culture. That is you know, who they are, what they've grown with. And so I think it's to somewhat kind of expand, you know, okay, well, okay, that's great. You like, you know, you like this or you're, you know, you're used to this, but there's other things out there. So as they grow and as they, they start to learn more about themselves and about the world, the seed has kind of already been planted that there's something else out there. There's another way to do things. This isn't the only way. Exactly. You can only do that through dialogue. Because mm -hmm. you cannot tell them you know, where the uh, latest um, you know, jeans or... Sneakers. You cannot tell them not to do that because that's what they value. That's what the media, that's the idea the media sells to them. You know? The media doesn't have to tell you buy this. First, you know, the media sells you the idea. Once the idea is sold, you're gonna see yourself wearing things that you have seen on TV. So how do we take sense or fight mass corporate media? Well, that's, gonna, that's a huge, huge task that all of us have to assume. Um, I don't know if I know the answer to that, but I guess we just have to continue um, educating ourselves, you know, uh, we don't have to try to explore alternative news because the news that we get from Fox, CNN, are news that are made up for us to serve their interests, not to serve our interests. So I think the media really plays a very important role 
and um, indoctrinating and misidicating the young folks, whether it's here or you know in Zimbabwe and Jamaica or Haiti. You know, so I think the media we should start paying attention closely, careful attention to the media. Yes. Um, at the same time, I also think that with um, famous people in our different cultures can also play a role. Like, for example, right. well, I'm from Kenya, and Wangari Maathai won a Nobel Peace Prize, and mm -hmm. she's a Kenyan woman. Mm -hmm. And because of her work with like the environment, now I'm more conscious about because she's someone I look up to, and so now I'm more conscious about the environment. Right, right. So I think leaders who are people we look up to in the countries we come from can be like really good sources of what yeah. we should do. I agree. Instead of using Kobe Bryant to um, <laughs> to make a buy Nike shoe, Kobe Bryant could have used his his fame to um, make some. To effect some social change, not to maximize profit of those corporate uh, institutions. But unfortunately, some famous people don't really use their fame to uh, for good things. You know, the well, they are being used in some way by by those in power. But unfortunately, uh, um, well, I would like to see people like Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, uh, LeBron James, mm -hmm. you know, one of the uh, yeah. <laughs> to use their fame. To um, to tell us not to buy Nike, not to buy the latest, you know, uh, jeans, got whatever, you know, you name it. You know all the brands. I don't know them. I'm, you know, I'm. I need to update myself, I guess. <laughs> 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 yes. Well, I think it's right. Yeah. Maybe more awareness about what they All people too. I think that's one of the media we can use to <laughs> to reach out to them. Right. Yes. Okay. Were you gonna say something? I say older folks too. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Right? Music. <laughs> that's, that's no, but uh, something I wanted to add actually to what you were just saying, it's um I think, yeah, we need more leaders, but I think we also need to look out and support our leaders because yeah. I think that they are actually people in our communities doing the work, you know, and walking the talk, as we say. But a lot of times they don't receive the attention or the support that, um, you know, would probably, um, you know, bring them to, not necessarily fame, but like spread out, you know, the, wor the words and the thinking and, because um, I do think that there are people in our communities, you know. I'm sure there are folks in here that are already, you know, doing this type of thing. So it's about, um, you know, uh, supporting each other and also um, encouraging. Because I think that sometimes that's part of the plan. It's like not to, uh, well, I say the plan, it's a like conspiracy theory, I guess. But, <laughs> but it's part of it is that we don't really uh, think, we think we don't have role models, but role models are out there. They're just not being portrayed as yeah. they should be portrayed. But I think and, I oh, yeah. and role models have to be famous people like Well, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, I'm sure there are plenty of role models here. I'm positive about that. Yeah. But then our government also, we need support from our government too. Because like, if I take, for example, Sam Benusman, was a great uh, movie maker. Mm -hmm. Back home, he's not well known mm -hmm. because people are more focused on westernized movies, mm -hmm. right, right, his right. movies, right, mm -hmm. right. and that's sad because right. he really, right. you know, made so many great things for Africa. Well, why do you think that people that's in your country value uh, what this guy does, mm -hmm. what's been doing, while they are valuing things that are coming from the West? Why? How do you explain that? 
colonization and slavery, the fact that we don't value enough ourselves. Yeah. So we need to support each other. For our own people who are doing so many things for, for us. In other words, whatever is westernized is supposed to be good. Mm -hmm. You don't have to question it. It's good. Yeah, don't question it. Exactly. Wear it, drink it, eat it. It's good. <laughs> Sorry, like if you're white and you just come and tell someone, like, exactly. yeah, he's white. He knows yeah. best. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So this, this, uh, those, those, those so-called experts, yeah. you know, they would pay thousands of money to someone to come from here or anywhere in the West to supposedly um, tell you what to, what to do. Things that you already knew. In fact, you are the one who's going to teach them how to do it. But they will not listen to you. You will not have a voice because you're not from here. Or at least you're not educated in the West. It's unfortunate. I think we need to take care of our own, well, I don't want to use that language. I don't want to swear here. But I think we need to, um, we need to learn how to value ourselves. You know, how to not only value it, but maintain it. Okay. Otherwise, we're gonna keep it's leaning in. Here. You wanted to say something for a while. The Westerners, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I was gonna say I completely agree that we need to support our leaders, but um, with regard to changing the influence of the media and changing what goes on in our countries, in a lot of ways, it starts with those of us here. Mm -hmm. It starts because everything that the media puts out there is based on demand. Mm -hmm. So if we don't ask for it, they don't put it out there. They're trying mm -hmm. to make profit. So everything yeah. that's out there is what we want. So it starts with us changing our demand. Well, they make you think and you need it. Advocating for something that is advocating for quality, having yeah. discussions like these, and then saying, okay, we're gonna we're gonna decide that we're not watching this. We're not. We're going to write to CNN and say, okay, you can't put this out there, that kind of thing, making that decision on our own, mm -hmm. instead of depending on them to take the initiative to change it, because they never will. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. So in a lot of ways, the change is going to be effected from us. Mm -hmm. um, finding ways to empower, to empower ourselves mm -hmm. and making that change first from here, from the first person, mm -hmm. and then expecting the change after that. Mm -hmm. I agree, except I would add that sometimes, <coughs> um, he said, another, the media will not make money if we don't, sure. if we're not willing to buy whatever they are selling. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, sometimes they, they make you want to buy to consent. You know, they, they, uh, they will sell you the idea, and before you know it, you're buying it. It's not that you needed it, but they first they, they're going to sell you the idea. Once the idea is sold, they will easily sell it to you. Like bottles of water. <laughs> exactly. They would say, you know, it's pure. <laughs> right? Yeah. You need to have right. a bottle of water. <laughs> 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 yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm kind of torn oh, between my friend. Between the two of you. Because I'm not really sure where I stand. Because I know you said that, well, we while we were talking, it was mentioned that, you know, if you go home, meet people at the level they're at, you know, with regards to language and stuff like that. But I mean, I'm trying to apply it here, you know, as a Mahoney College student who, you know, is a first generation college student. And basically, you know, we yes, we want to help our country, we want to help our people, but first we have to save ourselves as individuals. And so it's, although we might, you know, want to go home and do a lot of humanitarian work or try to transform our country's economy or the educational system or come what may, um, I find that, you know, in order to do that and have that flex the flexibility of going home and doing this type of work, you have to have made something of yourself with regards to financial stability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, coming to the U.S., you know, the, the Western culture, and even in the media and the magazines, you often find people who are going to, you know, developing countries, usually seeing the catalogs, there are, you know, people who are Caucasian descent, you know, going to help these African children or these people in the Caribbean. And I don't see the, the media as being, you know, I think the media in itself with regards to humanitarian work is actually showing what is the reality where why you still have the flexibility of going to, you know, these countries. Whereas me, I don't, have the, I don't have the time or the flexibility right now to be trying to go home and save my, I need to save myself first, you know, get an education, help my family, then, then I can do anything 
like that. Okay. So, you know, as my whole college students, you know, who are in a bind between, yes, I love my country, or I help the people, but my family depends on me, I depend on myself, you know, to make, to, to make it yeah, as I mean, well. It's, 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 it's uh, a kind of a, a bind between. Right, right. But the only, I agree with you. However, there's always an hour. However, um, the danger that I see in this type of thinking is that once you get too comfortable here, you might not want to go back home to her because you need to have all the means in order to help those who really need our help. You don't necessarily have to be rich to go back and help. And of course, of course, if you're starving, how can you help someone who's, who's starving? You know, two people are starving cannot really help each other. But you don't need to be financially, really financially stable in order to go back home and help. Some people, some people feel that they have to have a lot of money in order to go back home and help those who are really in, in need. I think it's a very uh, capitalist point of view, actually. Um, and I do agree with you, of course you have to have food here in order to help. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you really need to first make a lot of money, help your family, then help those who need help. I think it's, it's, it's a very individual, individual, individualistic view that I, that I do not quite share. Yes. I kind of have to agree a little bit with her. I mean, I worked um, doing kind of like, you know, nonprofit work for a long time, you know, because my idea was, you know, as soon as I was able, that whatever I had, I was going to give. And there comes a certain amount of personal sustainability. I mean, not that I, did, I, just, I feel that we shouldn't be helping others, but what is, you know, I can give everything I need to give, you know, I can decide that, you know, I don't have the, the means or, or whatever to go to school right now, I'm gonna focus on my community. 30 years down the line, you know, I, I have no savings, I have no health plan, I have, you know, my family, my mother who, you know, whatever family that I have, they're reaching, you know, elder years and everything like that. I can't help them, I'm still in the same position that I was, you know, when I was a 20 year old, you know? Yeah. And so there is a you know a certain balance that mm. um, you have to have there. Mm -hmm. I mean, my goal is to be financially stable at the same time helping my community. Mm. You know what what jobs are out there like that? What you know that are actually paying right. for right. you to to have right. that? And right. it's it's it is difficult. Well, I understand what you're saying, it's but when you say financially stable, juggle. I think that is the main. I mean, that could mean any anything to you know differently different things to different people. Financially stable could mean to me, for example, is to have. Um, a million dollars in my saving and have um, you know, it depends what you mean by financially stable. But uh, financially stable to me means that I am able to do the work, uh -huh. that I am able to do the work without, um, but for it to be sustainable to me, I know that's a buzzer, right. but mm -hmm. for it to, um, you know, 30 years down the line, I can still go strong. Or the fact that I'm not dependent on other people who are, who have those needs mm -hmm. to actually be able to sustain me. I don't have to, you know, be in a position where I'm constantly, you know, like I, I'm constantly applying for help, applying for help to be able to give help to someone else. Right. I need to be able to, to do this, yeah. to back it. Yeah. I mean, that's how foundations out there fund their causes, right. strong foundations. Right. 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 And I feel like, you know, where are our foundations? Where are our strong foundations? Our, you know, our, our strong entrepreneurs or the people with power mm -hmm. that can actually, I mean, we have, you know, there's Oprah Winfrey. And she decides she wants to open a school, she can do it. Right. <laughs> you know, I hope you don't, you don't want to be like Oprah before you no. decide. To <laughs> right. No, but just, I, I don't no, understand your sister. I mean, of course you have to be able to eat and have a place to Stay hopefully before. <laughs> yeah, anyway. But there's somebody back there who was yes. like, we wanted to talk about. Um, uh, first of all, I'm sorry I had to be picked up, and so I was late, but thank you so much for just the part that I was able to be here, and thank you, Makasa, for, for bringing our speakers. I have a question which actually relates to, to what's just been said, but as I listen to the comments, especially, I noticed the theme in them about morality and questioning the materialism of Western modernity. Mm -hmm. And nobody said, we have a problem with the materialism of Western modernity and we want something else. But it seemed to me that that was underneath mm -hmm. many of the comments that were made. Mm -hmm. For example, talking about how do we deal with a recognition of privilege in a society that has lots of poverty. Mm -hmm. So my question is, if, you know, if I think about the consequences 
of colonialism. Part of that, or maybe the most important part of that, is materialism. Is saying, let's have a world with the individual in the center and God on the edge. Mm -hmm. If God exists, on the edge. Mm -hmm. I'm in the middle. Mm -hmm. How can, how can people repudiate that kind of materialism and and make use of an education that's set in that materialism? Sure, that's a big question. That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> let me take, let me. That's a great let question. Let me try to answer some of it. I think. First thing we should recognize that there are there has always been power relations. In order to remain in power, you have to have financial means. So in order in order for the U.S. to remain powerful, the U.S. had to invade and occupy other countries, not only occupy but exploit the resources. So I think it's it's come it comes down to the notion of power. In order to have, in order to be powerful, some people, some people have to be powerless. In order to make them powerless, I have to get what they have. I have to deprive them. I have to deprive them of that basic need, pretty much. You know, I have to. I have to keep whatever I got from them and don't share it. Because if I share it with them, then I'm going to be equal. And if I'm equal to you, then there is an in-power relation. So in order to maintain a power relation, the unequal power relations, I have to exploit, exhaust your resources. I, I guess that's all I have to <laughs> say. If, if there is anybody else, please jump in. I don't want to monopoli monopolize the thing here. Does that answer part of your question? No. Uh, I guess what I would respond to that is that's one kind of power. But isn't there another kind of power that comes from humility? Mm. And so uh, 